In the previous edition of this series, I went in-depth on the state of Arkansas, which was once a Democratic-leaning state, then a swing state, and now a solidly Republican state. Today's episode features a state that has had essentially the opposite journey. For a very long time, it was a deep red state, and then around 15 to 20 years ago, it became a competitive swing state, and today it's pretty much a solidly Democratic state with only a few exceptions. The state in question here is Virginia, perhaps one of the best examples of a classic American suburban realignment, which is what today's video will focus on. I mean, just compare these two maps. The first one is George W. Bush's 2000 win, and the second is Joe Biden's 2020 win. There are a lot of differences you can probably already recognize, but nowhere saw as big of a change as the northern part of the state, directly south of Washington, D.C. But it's not only the D.C. metro area. Virginia's political changes over the past 20 years have come in many different areas spread out all across the state. That's what makes their case so fascinating. Let's go back to the 2000 election results in Virginia. As mentioned earlier, it voted for George W. Bush by a fairly solid margin, this case being around 8%. As seen on this map, Bush performed particularly well in the suburbs, netting huge margins in the areas surrounding Washington, D.C., Richmond, and Virginia Beach, which are the population centers of the state. This came as a result of his strength with college graduates, as he won the demographic by 13%. Bush also did very well with wealthy voters, of which there are many in the suburbs. Virginians who had an annual income of over $100,000 supported Bush by a margin of 61 to 36%. And to get more specific, these voters were primarily concentrated in the northern part of the state, directly south of D.C., as mentioned. In 2022, Loudoun County, which is right here at the top of the state, was ranked the most wealthy county in America by average annual income. Coming in second was the independent city of Falls Church, which is also in the Nova area. Finally, the largest county in the D.C. suburbs, Fairfax County, came in fifth place, which means that of the five wealthiest counties in the country last year, Three were in Northern Virginia alone. While Falls Church did in fact vote for Al Gore, Fairfax and Loudoun backed George W. Bush. This coalition of wealthy, educated voters had propelled the GOP to another strong victory in Virginia, but it was also clear at the same time that there was considerable downside to this coalition. If educated voters ever swung against Republicans, they would lose their competitiveness in the state. Luckily for Bush, that didn't happen, at least in 2004. While John Kerry did notably flip the Nova metro area as a whole, he won it by less than 4%, his improvements were not enough to win in the state. Nevertheless, these performances helped set the groundwork for Obama to flip the state blue for the first time in 44 years. Bolstered by an increase in turnout from the urban parts of the state and massive swings against Republicans in the suburbs, Obama came away with a 6.3% margin of victory, outperforming Kerry by over 14%. On top of winning huge margins from Fairfax and other independent cities in the D.C. suburbs, Obama eked out a victory in Loudoun County, which had also not voted for a Democratic presidential candidate since 1964. But it wasn't only the suburbs of Nova that saw a huge swing towards Obama. He also improved hugely in the Richmond metro area, winning nearly 58% of the two-party vote there despite Kerry having lost it just four years prior. He also notably won the Virginia Beach area by a huge margin. He got 59% of the vote. And this was, again, a huge improvement over John Kerry. These double-digit swings in essentially every major metro area in the state propelled Obama to a huge victory, and he held on in 2012 despite Mitt Romney's unique appeal to voters in the suburbs. 2016 was the first year in a while Virginia hadn't really been considered to be a swing state. Obama had won it twice, and Republicans hadn't won a Senate race there since 2002, leading many to believe he was essentially safe for the Democratic Party from that point out. Additionally, Hillary Clinton's running mate, Tim Kaine, was from Virginia. But despite all these factors, Trump actually performed pretty well in the state, losing it by just five points and holding Hillary Clinton to below 50% of the vote. Trump made significant gains in the state's rural west, but he was unable to overcome the left range that had defined the suburbs over the past decade. He lost Nova by 30%, Virginia Beach by 15%, and the Richmond area by 21%. Again, in 2000, Bush carried Nova and Richmond and came within 2% of winning Virginia Beach. But it was 2020 when the disaster for Republicans officially culminated in the state. Despite holding on to neighboring North Carolina, Donald Trump was defeated in Virginia by over 10%. He lost Nova by 36%, Richmond by 29%, and Virginia Beach by 21%. These margins were detrimental to the GOP's ability to remain competitive in the state, and they reflect the massive turnaround that has defined Virginia's elections over the past 20 years. Earlier on in this video, I mentioned how George W. Bush performed well with educated voters and with wealthy voters. These Virginians, primarily concentrated in the state's suburbs, or what allowed him to secure a pair of victories in the state, despite underperforming Donald Trump in many of the rural counties. But 20 years later, when Trump became the first Republican presidential candidate to lose Virginia by double digits since Thomas E. Dewey in 1944, Republicans lost college-educated voters by 17%, and 
and only when voters made greater than $100,000 by 7%. These numbers represent severe underperformances compared to that of Bush from 2000, and at its core, Virginia has turned away from the Republican Party because these voters have turned away from the Republican Party. But our story doesn't end there, and I would be omitting some very important details if I ended the video here. Of course, you probably know what I'm alluding to. In 2021, Republicans snapped their 12-year losing streak in Virginia when Glenn Youngkin won the governor's race. Youngkin defeated former Democratic Governor Terry McAuliffe by just under 2%, marking a huge swing in momentum within the state. Youngkin won because he was successfully able to define the election. Rather than making it a national referendum or another Biden versus Trump battle, Youngkin was able to lower the stakes of the race and ultimately had more voters thinking about education and the economy than which party they wanted in control of Congress or the presidency. In politics, we call this denationalization, and it generally helps candidates running in states that are otherwise unfavorable with their party. As a result of this dynamic, Duncan managed to hold on to the GOP base and win over just enough Democrats to emerge victorious over McAuliffe statewide. But while Youngkin's campaign was brilliant and effective, it wouldn't have worked in other states. Virginia in specific was a perfect fit for him due to its wealthy suburbs. Youngkin understood that many voters in the suburbs were conservative on issues like the economy and education, but in previous years they'd been voting for Democrats because of the rhetoric of the Republican candidates that had turned them off. To combat this, Youngkin strayed away from many of the issues that had previously been toxic to Republicans among educated suburbanites, and instead focused on raising his own personal popularity with swing voters. This worked. Exit polls showed that on election day, 50% of Virginians viewed him favorably, compared to 46% who did not. Additionally, voters seemed to agree with Youngkin on what was important in the election. A combined 57% of voters told exit polls that their most important issue was either the economy or education. Voters who listed education backed Youngkin by a 53 to 47 margin, and voters who listed the economy gave him a 55 to 44 margin. But of course, Youngkin's win doesn't change how Virginia is trending. He ran in an off-year local election, and while his win was definitely impressive, it's not likely a sign of a Republican comeback in the state. Additionally, it's worth noting that 2021 may have just been a fluke. Turnout from urban counties and voters of color fell drastically, while turnout from white rural areas remained significantly more stable, thus creating a much more Republican-leaning electorate. In 2022, Democrats came back and won the House popular vote in the state, by just 2% less than 2020, despite the overall more Republican-leaning environment. Thus, it's my opinion that while Youngkin's victory in 2021 was certainly a good thing for Republicans, it doesn't represent any reversion in trends in Virginia, which has become a state defined by how its educated population in the suburbs votes. As more and more people move into these metro areas and as more and more voters get a college education, it's likely that Virginia will keep swinging towards Democrats. In 2024, I expect Biden to carry the state by a little more than the previous time, and these gains will, as always, be made possible by the voters in the suburbs. Republicans have fundamentally changed their coalition over the course of the past few decades. In my previous video, I discussed how rural voters in states like Arkansas have flocked to the party. But today, I hope I've helped you observe trends that show the opposite. Voters in the suburbs, in bigger states like Virginia, have trended towards Democrats, and they will continue to trend towards Democrats until something fundamentally changes in American politics. It is my firm belief that due to the nature of the new coalitions, Republicans have lost Virginia at the federal level for a generation, and in the future, we'll likely see Democratic margins of victory expand as the population and influence of the suburbs grows.